And I'm going to be talking about uh, joint work with uh, Thomas, Robert, and Jingwei. So, oops. Okay. Just click on the slide. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, there, yeah. So, some motivation. Um, it is well known, and it was proved by Wang, that the Virasoro vertex algebras are rational with finally many reducible representations, if and only if the central charges of this form, and we call this the minimal models. Uh, and in, in this in this situation, the tensor product theory developed by Huang Alipovsky applies, and this was proved by Huang in 2008. Um, for other center charges, the Virasoro vertex algebra is uh, in general um, irrational. It has five, infinitely many irreducible modules, and in general has non-semi-simple representation theory. Only recently, we were able to prove with collaborators that the logarithmic tensor product theory, so a generalization of this tensor product theory to the logarithmic situation in which you have either infinitely many um, irreducibles or non semisimple representation theory applies to the um, to all center charges. So now we would like to answer a similar question, but in the super setting, in the C2 setting. So if we think of the n equals one super Virasoro vertex algebra, then Adamovich proved that this vertex operator superalgebra is again rational if and only if the central charges are of this form with P and Q in this discrete set. Um, and Miles and Huang proved that um, super generalization of the, their tensor product theory applies in this case. And we would like to know if uh, we can still say that there is a tensor product structure in a nice enough category of modules for the super n equals one Virasoro vertex algebra for all central charges. So including those central charges in which we'll have non-semi-simple representation theory. Um, great, so in particular, that's the logarithmic tensor product um, theory developed by Lipovsky, Huang, and Shang apply to some nice enough category with some super modifications since we're in the super setting. Great. The plan for the talk is to introduce the Nevis Schwartz algebra, so the n equals one algebra. Uh, recall what a vertex operator super algebra is and fix some notation. Um, choose the right category of modules, and we will see that C1 cofinanceness, which is a technical condition, will be the key to choosing the right um, module category. And the goal is to prove that enough conditions from the Juan Lebowski Shang uh, theory are satisfied that we can guarantee that there's braided tensor um, structure. Great. So the never short uh, n equals one super Virasoro algebra is a least super algebra with infinitely many generators. Um, C is central. The Lns are even and actually give a copy of the Virasoro algebra, and the Gms um, are odd. And they satisfy the following commutator relations for the even elements and anti commutator relations for the odd elements. And C is central. I should have said that. Oh, there is. Um, it is a super extension of the Virasoro algebra. And we're going to build very modules. So we fix a triangular decomposition and we're going to call the positive part of the Nova Schwartz algebra this space. Um, the zero part is going to be this space and the non negative part is going to be this space. And we do the usual business. We're going to define just the highest weight representation by grabbing a one dimensional vector space, giving it a uh, very equal than zero module structure by letting the central element act by a scalar C, a complex number. Um, L0 act by another scalar H. That's why we fix here C and H. And um, all of the positive part acts by zero. So we just induce and we get the Berman module. And here's a graphical representation of what the Berman module looks like. Um, so we have, of course, the, the lowest weight vector. And we have, for instance, L minus one, the lowest weight vector. But now we have half integer things because we've allowed um, this odd cheese to show up. Great. And maybe we can start with something easy. There's a point carry of feet argument of why these are this is a really good representation of all the elements in this Fermat module. So just to warm up, we can see, for instance, that G minus one half um, squared really is. <coughs> L minus one by using this anti commutator with minus one half minus one half, we obtain this relation. And this really tells us that G minus one half squared is L minus one. So that's why uh, G minus one half squared is not another element at this level. 
well, analogously, one can, if you had them in this um, weird order, we want the most negative index to be to the left, so we can just use the anti-commutator to reorder them. And that's why um, those elements don't appear. And g minus one half to the fourth, well, it's g minus one half squared L minus one, of course, but we can use the relation between um, G's and L's to actually move this G minus one half closer to the lowest weight factor and show that it's really L minus one squared. So we don't have to worry about those numbers. Great. Okay. In particular, now that we have a nice grading on this um, Berman modules for the N equals one superior star algebra, where, I mean, this looks a little horrible, but basically we're just saying this is degree zero, this is degree one half, this is degree one, this is degree um, three halves, et cetera. Great. We'll have some irreducible modules. So when we grab a Berman module, we fix a central charge C in a conformal weight H, and chances are that that Berman module will already be irreducible. However, if your Berman module is reducible, then it has a maximum submodule, and when you take this quotient, you end up with an irreducible module. So J could be trivial or not, but in any case, we're going to call L and S the irreducible highest weight modules for um, the N equals one. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Great, and a remark, just like with other theories, um, a highest weight module is reducible if and only if there is a singular vector in that strictly positive degree part. You want a singular vector that generates a proper submodule, and that will only happen if and only if you have a singular vector here. Great. Okay, what's a vertex operator superalgebra? Robert mentioned the definition of vertex operator algebra, and we'll just generalize it to the super case. It's um, a super vector space that has a nice grading. In our case, it'll be half Z graded. Uh, a special vector that we call the vacuum vector is an even vector of degree zero. Uh, another special vector that we call the conformal vector that will give us a representation of the Vera Soro algebra. And a linear even map that eats elements in uh, V and speeds up um, power series with coefficients and endomorphisms of V that has uh, poles in Z, but not so bad in the sense that when you evaluate this power series in another element of B, you end up with something that has poles in C, but only finally many powers of Z are gonna be negative. Great, and of course it satisfies certain axioms. Um, the vacuum axioms say we send the vacuum to just the identity map. And if you evaluate any such vertex operator in the vacuum, you end up with only positive powers of Z and you can evaluate this in C equals zero and recover the original um, element of V that you put in the map. And the, we require a grading compatibility and the Jacobi identity, which looks a little bit like the Jacobi identity for Lie algebras in which we're taking the difference between two operators, except there's some delta corrections that um, describe expansions of the same meromorphic function in different complex domains. And because we're talking about super algebras, there's also a sign from um, switching elements. Great. And uh, we also want the graded components to be finite dimensional. We want the graded components to be zero for n sufficiently small. And we want this special vector that we call the conformal vector to give us a representation of the Vera Soro algebra with central charge C. And we want L zero to give us the degree of each vector. Great. And finally, um, sorry, the derivative property, which says L minus one behaves like the formal derivative. Great. So um, what's in over shorts vertex operator algebra or the n equals one vertex operator super algebra? Well, you grab the Verma module that we've discussed um, for any central charge and for conformal weight zero. So H has been fixed to be zero. And then you mod out by the sub module generated by G minus one half acting on the lowest weight vector. So here's, here's the Verma module for any central charge in H equal to zero. And then I'm gonna kill everyone that's a descendant of G minus one half the vacuum. So after we, we kill all those elements, we end up with a vertex operator super algebra. And I'm gonna call it many names, but maybe N equals one super Vera Soro will be the one that will show up from now. And here's an updated picture of what this um, vertex operator super algebra looks like. Great. And what's the vertex operator superalgebra structure? Well, the vacuum is just the, the highest weight vector. The conformal element is this element of degree two. And its expansion is defined, or the map Y is defined as just putting all the generators for the Vera algebra in a power series in this way. 
which is pretty standard for vertex um, algebra theory. And we also define y in this other um, degree three half vector in this way by putting all the generators, the odd generators in a power series. And now we can use a general theorem that says we can define y in any, uh, any element of this form by just taking the normal order product of these two fields that we build in its corresponding derivatives. So this is the structure of vertex operator superalgebra n equals for the n equals one algebra, and um, it has super conformal structure. So it has really, I would say, three special vectors: the conformal vector omega, and remember that we define y in omega in this way. If I write it in the most standard notation of vertex algebra, one can see that the minus one product of omega is l minus two. And we have another special vector that we're going to call tau, the Navier-Schwarz vector. And again, we define the map y in this special vector in this way. And if I rewrite it in the more standard product expansion for vertex algebra, one can see that tau minus one is g minus three halves. So I'm writing this minus one product because they'll be important in a second. Great. So what's a module for a vertex operator superalgebra? Uh, well, it's uh, Again, a super space together with another even in your map such that all the axioms that carry make sense. So again, we have a power series that's not too bad. We send it back into the identity. L minus one behaves like the formal derivative and we have a Jacobi identity, which involves delta corrections and a sign. And um, when we um, put the conformal vector in this even linear map, we end up with a field that gives us a representation of the Virat super algebra with the same central charge as our vertex operator super algebra hat. Great. So, moreover, we're going to ask that each of the um, graded components here are eigenspaces for L0 with eigenvalue n, and that the dimension of each of these graded components be finite and lower bounded. And actually, we can relax this notion a little bit. We can kind of cross out the last request. We can cross out the second to last request. And if we replace it with WN is a generalized eigenspace for L0 with eigenvalue N, we're talking about a generalized B module. And I, I would like to make a point that the central charge is fixed. The central charge of any V module must be the central charge of the vertex algebra V. Great. Okay, so. Any Verma module is an example of a module for n equals one super Virasoro algebra. And the map, so just because the notation is a little confusing, let me just remark. This is a Verma module, so H is any complex number. And this is a vertex operator super algebra in which we have fixed H to be zero. And we have killed the submodule generated by the descendants of G minus one half, the lowest weight vector. Great. And I claim that. For this vertex operator superalgebra, any of these guys is a module in the sense of the definition that we just discussed. And um, the map is just given by the usual thing because we already have some um, Lie theory structure that tells us this is a module for the, for the super Lie algebra and we just use that and we get a module structure for the vertex operator superalgebra. Great. Of course, the central charges, the C and the C are the same, of course. Great. Um, we have, oops, I would like to move this so that we can see those names. <laughs> okay, so we have information about reducible Verma modules and we have embedding diagrams between Verma modules. So the following is true for the Neve Schartz uh, Lee super algebra. If you have a map between two Verma modules, it must be an embedding. And we actually have a list of all the Verma modules that talk to each other. And this is what the Oops. embedding diagrams look like. Uh, one so we have a list of all the conformal weights, I'm sorry, that uh, such that these Vermas are reducible. And we have some information about the singular vectors. I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself and the Verma diagrams are coming in the next slide. But we do know that if you are lucky and you're working with a reducible Verma module, then we know that um, if it has a singular vector at degree Rs over two, then, this is the shape of the singular vector. And let's ignore that horrible expression for a second. You have G minus one half to the two N 
on the highest weight vector plus some horrendous sum. And instead of explaining what this horrendous sum is, I would like to give some examples. So this is the singular vector at degree one half. We know this one, right? It's the one we killed when we were building the vertex operator super algebra. This is the singular vector at degree one. And we also have some familiarity with this one because it's the one that shows up when you're building the Vera Soro vertex operator algebra. This is the singular vector degree three halves, and this is the singular vector at degree um, two. So what this Corbel formula is telling us is that if there's another term that doesn't involve just g minus one halves, this only involves g minus one half, this only involves g minus one half because it's g minus one half squared. But if there is another term, then it has at least a g minus three halves or an L minus two. This is a very technical condition, but it will be very helpful when we're choosing the right category to try to apply um, the tensor category of function. What, what, what is t? The little t? Little t? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So it's a, a parameter for the central charge. So the central charge, oops. Oh, Sorry, I, I forgot it's about that. That's right. It's 15 pass. Minus three. Yeah, and I'm sorry, that, that will show up later. That's why that T is showing up there. We're already parametrizing central charges in this way, and we can also parametrize conformal uh, weights in a similar way, depending on T, R, and S. And then this is what the formula looks like. And we can ignore the horrible part and just write it's some polynomial in C and H times an L minus two. Of course, this could be a zero times something. We don't care about what else plus someone that involves a g minus three halves or an l minus three or a g minus five halves. So what I'm saying is there's not going to be any terms that have purely just g minus one halves. Great. So we know um, what the embedding between Verma modules look like. I guess I'll leave that there. Uh, so they look a lot like um, the Virasoro algebra embeddings. Hmm. Down? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. In the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, we have this. These are the possible situations. So as I said, most Verma modules are irreducible. But if you're in the situation in which you have a reducible Verma module, then it either has an infinite chain of Verma modules inside it in this way, or this sort of zigzag chain, which corresponds to the minimal models, for instance, or just one Verma inside it that's irreducible. Great. And this will be helpful for us because we'll be interested in throwing away Vermas that are irreducible. I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Okay, so I would like to say a little bit about tensor products for vertex operator super algebras without going into details, but um, very naively, you could say, well, if M1 is a module for the least super algebra, yeah. Of course. So, can you go back to the yes. first one? Yes. Something kind of puzzled me. Yes. So, in the Virasoro case, here you don't put restriction on the standard chart, right? So, C can be anything. That's right. Right. So, in already in the Virasoro case, there there are embedding diagram that reverses the arrow. Yes. Like all of these arrows. That's are right. Reversed. That's You're right. Saying that in the super n equals one super case, then. Those diagrams don't exist? No, they do. They do. But they will look like this again. So it could be that this is finite oh, so this, or infinite. It's just, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's right. just like the shape of the phenomenon. That's all. I'm, and, and, and we have the information. I didn't put it in this slide, but I just want to say we know how Berman modules talk to each other. That's right. But you're, you're right. It could be that this is a finite thing and we would get all the errors reversed. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say it again? I'm so here. Are you talking about this line? Yes, here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that mean that like two different kernels? So this means that the maximal submodule inside this guy is generated by two singular vectors and each of them generate a Verma module. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And this is what in the, for instance, Vera Soro algebra case gives you rationality of that VOA because you don't just mod out by the first singular vector, you mod out by the second one and then you kill a bunch of modules. Yeah, so this is actually, it's very difficult to work with this um, 
when you're working with the universal object, the universal Virasoro or the universal super Virasoro, these are more difficult for us, but they are the ones that we prefer in general if they're the minimum models. Once we go to the to the simple POA. Great. So if M1 and M2 are modules for the n equals one um, Lee super algebra, naively, one would want to say, well, let's just take the vector space M1 tensor M2. And that is not a bad idea. That will be, again, a module for this least super algebra. However, if you look at the action of, for instance, the central charge, right? This is a, it's a module with a diagonal action, like the Lee algebra in the first thing, tensor the identity plus the identity, tensor the Lee algebra in the second thing. But the central charge, you can see already, if we fix the central charge as acting by a scalar, will not survive. So the tensor product of vector spaces is not a module for the vertex operator super algebra because the central charge is 2C. And that was one of the things that we asked from modules, that they preserve the central charge of the vertex operator superalgebra. So the notion of a tensor product for vertex operator superalgebra modules is more subtle. Um, and the correct notion is the PC tensor product defined by Huang, Lebowski, and Shang, and further generalized by Huang, Milas, Thomas, Shishank, Robert, Jingwei, and many more to the super case and further studied. Uh, and I will not get into the details of what it is, but I'll say is the restricted dual um, to a subspace of the dual of M1 tensor M2 as vector spaces that satisfies certain compatibilities and allows us to build associativity and braiding. Great. From our read from R and many people's recent work, uh, C1 cofaniness is a reasonable technical condition to obtain tensor structure. So in the rational case, C2 cofaniness was something that guaranteed that we could use the old tensor uh, product theory and C1 cofaniness is a relaxed condition that still gives us uh, ready tensor uh, structure in general. Great, so what is C1 cofaniness? If we have a, a vertex operator superalgebra that's graded in this way, we're gonna think of the strictly positive part of it as this defined this way. Uh, and we're gonna grab a module, a B module W, and define its C1 space as the span over the complex numbers of all the minus one products of things in the strictly positive part of the vertex algebra times anyone in the module. Great. And we're gonna say that the module is C1 cofinite if the dimension of the module mod its C1 space is finite. Great. In the case of a n equals one super vera so vertex algebra, the, the strictly positive part, here's our, our vertex of our super algebra. It is half graded. The strictly positive part starts here because we've killed g minus one half and we've killed g minus one half squared. This is the first element that's an, in the strictly positive part. So this is what the strictly positive part looks like is from here and down. And, um, we already discussed this. If we take the conformal vector, then we know that it's minus one product is L minus two. And if we take tau, which is a positive vector, omega is a positive vector as well in this sense, it's part of the positive part of the vertex algebra, then it's minus one product is G minus three halves. Great, so if we wanna think of minus one products of positive parts in, uh, of positive things in our vertex operator super algebra, the best we can do is L minus two and G minus three halves in terms of the L's and G's. So our Berman module C1 go find it. Well, here's our VOA. Here's the positive part of our VOA. And as we said, the best we can grab, the, the, the highest in this drawing that we can grab is G minus three halves. And if we want L's, it's L minus two. So what is um, a Berman module mod its C1 space? Oops. Well, here's a bare map. We can grab any of these elements. But if we want to, for instance, catch G minus one in the vacuum, we can't do that as the minus one product of someone here times someone here. So I claim the C1 space of this Berman module is anyone that involves an L minus two or L minus three or L minus four and anyone that involves a G minus three halves or a G minus five halves, et cetera. So when I take the quotient of a Verma module by C1 space, I end up with infinitely many people out there that are linearly independent. There are infinitely many linearly independent vectors that are not in the C1 space of this Verma module. So Verma modules are bad 
they're not zero cofinite. Fortunately, many irreducible modules are not isomorphic to Verma modules, but are actually honest quotients of Verma modules by other modules. And this will be helpful to us. So what happens if we grab an irreducible that's not a Verma module? Well, that would happen if your Verma happened to be reducible, there was a singular vector in there, and we know that it looks something like this. So now let's analyze the singular vector. And we don't really care what the details are here, but we do care that the only things that show up here have an L minus two or a G minus three halves, because those are minus one products of the positive part of our vertex superior superalgebra. Great, so this expression, the horrible expression that we covered before is in the C1 space of the Sperma module. If we quotient out by the submodule generated by the singular vector, this is gonna die. So it's definitely gonna be in the C1 space. And C1 spaces behave nicely with respect to taking quotients. So one can see that the, C, the irreducible mod its C1 space, it's isomorphic to this, which actually gives us something nice. So now we've killed G minus one half to the two N, the lowest weight vector became something in C1. So we only end up with finally many linearly independent vectors in the quotient of L by its C1 space. Quotient of an irreducible that's not Verma by its C1 space. So irreducible modules, which are not Verma modules, are C1 cofinite. Great. So now we're going to define two categories. We're going to define O, OC finite, the category of finite length generalized modules with composition factors irreducibles that are not Verma modules. Because remember, we don't like Verma modules that are not C1 cofinite. We want irreducibles that are honest quotients of Verma modules by non trivial submodules. And we're going to define C1 to be the category of lower bounded C1 cofinite generalized modules. Um, the first category is really good because it is closed undertaking submodules, direct sums, quotients, and contact reading duals, which are all ingredients that we need for the Huang Lebowski Shang uh, tensor category theory. And the second one, it's really nice because it is closed under this PC tensor product. And this was proved by Miyamoto in 2014, and it needs a super modification that we checked um, works because Miyamoto proved it for the vertex operator algebra case. Great, and what we proved in our work in progress does this categories coincide? So it would be really hard to show that this category is closed under PC tensor product. But we can kind of avoid doing that directly by proving that in the case of n equals one super superior algebra, these two categories are the same. Great. And let me maybe sketch the proof. Um, <laughs> one of the inclusions is actually very easy. Uh, here's what O is, finite length generalized modules, and C1, lower bounded C1 cofinite modules. So if you grab a module um, that is finite length and that has composition factors irreducible not very mass, then it has this resolution with each sub quotient an irreducible number ma, and therefore C1 cofinite. And it's very easy to show that we can lift C1 cofinite. So in particular, W1 is W1 mod zero and it's C1 cofinite. And we also know that W2 mod W1 is C1 cofinite, so we can lift it thanks to a result of, of one. Great, so inductively we get the W C1 cofinite. The other inclusion is not so easy, uh, but we do it by building a sequence of highest weight modules so if you grab someone that's C1 cofinite and lowest, lower bounded, you can choose the smallest eigenvalue um, with eigenvector in W and not in its C1 space. And you can see where we're heading. Hopefully, this is a finite dimensional space. So whatever we do will end in a finite number of steps. Um, because W is lower bounded, one can show that this vector is actually a singular vector. So it generates a, a lowest weight module. And the quotient of the, the module that we started with by this lowest weight module is again a C1 cofinite lower bounded module. So we can again graph another eigenvalue now with eigenvector in this quotient space and not in its C1 space. And again, we can see that this is the lowest weight module in um, W mod W1, so not where we wanted it, but we can lift it. We can find W2 in W that contains W1 such that this 
is isomorphic to our lowest weight module. And now this guy is uh, C1. So we continue in this manner and the process ends um, once you have a space like this that's equal to its C1 space. I claim there's a finite number of steps because the, this dimension is finite and you, end, you finish when this happens, but one can show that if this happens, you actually get that WM must be W. So this last thing in, the, in this um, sequence of epimorphisms is actually zero. And um, each of the subsequent quotients is a lowest weight module. So we've obtained a sequence of um, injections in this form in which each subsequent thing is a lowest weight module. The bad thing is that we don't know that that lowest weight module is C1 cofinite a priori. So that's when we have to use all of this information that we have about um, Verma diagrams and embedding diagrams to show that if this lowest weight module is appearing here, we're in C1 cofinite, the module that we started with, W, could not be C1 cofinite. So we do that and we can show that every lowest weight module um, appearing in this resolution is C1 cofinite, and then we can extend it so that each composition factor is actually an irreducible number of the module. Great. So this shows that these categories are the same. And um, this is our theorem for any central charge. The category of generalized <coughs> finite length NC modules, or N equals one super Virasoro modules, whose composition factors isomorphic to number my reducibles has pretty tensor category. And oh, then you will make it on time. Great. Let me just tell you a little bit about rigidity. Can you say it again? No, no. And actually, uh, we threw away Verma modules, which are the reasonable, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about my, uh, which are the reasonable uh, projective covers for simples. So no, we can't. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a problem. We of course would like to be able to do this, but we probably would have to enlarge, uh, make the the category larger in some way. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's that's um, we get braided tensor uh, category structure, but we've thrown away candidates for projective colors. And um, of course, our hope is to be able to establish rigidity for all center charges, but this is far from done. So let me just maybe tell you um, what we can do. And um, for certain center charges, we can establish rigidity. So the existence of duals, dual modules that are compatible with the associativity and all the tensor category structure. And um, here's the C of T. So here's the parameterization of our central charge. Uh, as a function of t, and t in principle can be any complex number, non-zero. Um, it's very easy to show that if t is not rational, then this category is actually semi-simple, which is not at all what we expect for all central charges. We definitely expect non-semi-simple um, categories, but when you fix t to not be rational, you can actually show that the category is semi-simple. And um, Thomas, Gallardo, and Andy show that for generic T, so for all that um, at most countably many values of T, there is this really cool realization of uh, the product of N equals one super Virasoro with free fermions. <laughs> and they are this infinite order extension of the tensor product of Virasoro modules. So this thing on the right is honest Virasoro modules. That's why they have the beer. For central charge CL bar, in A, this, and B, this. So this is a, something that depends on T, and this is something that depends on T. This holds generically. Um, then we proved uh, in our previous work on the Virasor algebra that the modules involved in this decomposition when T is irrational um, are rigid. So the Virasor modules are rigid. And moreover, we can prove that um, Oh no, this is not us, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thomas, Robert, and Jean Wei show that for generic T, the semi-simple tensor category generated by the simples in R category is rigid, which is not quite what we want, is the semi-simple tensor category generated by this guys. But we can show actually that when T is not rational, 
this decomposition holds. So not just for generic, but for all irrational values of T. And then it follows by the rigidity of the, the Virasoro modules that our N equals one category is rigid for um, C of this form and T any rational number. Great, of course, we helped establish rigidity for other center charges and this is work in progress. Um, but so far we've been able to prove rigidity for this central charges. And that's all, thank you.